بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. What was the government style? Was it completely different than the Abbasids? It was different in some ways. So the Abbasids had、uh, a slave bodyguard. You know, the Mamluk, the famous Mamluk bodyguard. Now, Mamluk means in Arabic literally the owned person, right? The person who is owned. But the term Mamluk is specific to military slavery, and military slavery is very different than the plantation slavery that we know of in the U.S. The military slaves, the Mamluks, would often run the entire empire. So that's the model under the Mamluk Empire, which is another famous empire based in Cairo at this same time. In the Ottoman case, the royal family did, but they used Mamluks. Or what you might think of as Mamluks, they're they're the Janissaries, and the Janissaries, and and this is an important part of the Ottoman society and their history. The Janissaries came into the system through what is called the Dev Shirme, and the Dev Shirme in Turkish literally means the gathering together, and and you can think of it in a way as a prelude to modern conscriptions or modern drafts, like military drafts. And what they did is that they took roughly twenty percent of the males under their rule in the Balkans. So we're talking ethnic Serbs, ethnic Bulgarians, Croats, Albanians at first, and what later became Bosniaks as well. We're all part of this Dev Shirme, and they would come into the Ottoman system as pubescent teenagers, effectively, and they would they would all be Christian. At first, you could not be Muslim and enter this system because you were serving. The Muslim dynasty, and you converted to Islam. That was part of the process. Is that upon graduation you would convert to Islam, and you would not be freed. Now, this is one of the quirks of the Ottoman system. You would still be a slave, even though you were a Muslim, which is legally suspect. is is actually the way to think of it. And、um, but that's the system they had. And these Dev Shirme graduates. Would become either military or bureaucratic, effectively. So if they were, if they had talent with、uh, numbers, they might go into the treasury. If they had talent with writing and calligraphy and grammar, they might go into the the chancery.、Um, if they had talent with well busting heads, they went into the military. But on the whole, they were not recruiting from amongst the Balkan elite. They were recruiting from the Balkan peasantry, and turning them into elites. So, so it would be more like in the in the American context, if some entity were recruiting out of the countryside, out of the out of the poor, and then turning them into the new elite would be would be a closer parallel. And then, I mean, you say by force, there's a mixed record there. Some parents out in Balkan villages would be like, "Here, take my son, please," because that son could be. Some day, you know, the general or the the minister or the grand vizier, which is the equivalent of a prime minister in the modern era, and so it's it's a it's a ticket for advancement. So some parents were like, "Yeah, here, take my kid, please,"、uh, because they might become all powerful some day. And then there's counter stories to that narrative where they say, "No, don't take my kid because he'll become a Muslim, and I don't want that," you know, because their parents are. Greek, Bulgarian, what have you. So, it's it's, it's a mixed record. Nobody's you can't point to any、uh, extreme in that comparison because nobody's sure, and it's anecdotal in any case, and nobody took polls.、Um, so, in today's world, the Ottoman historians and the 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 Turkish view, if you will, is that it was mostly a positive.、Hmm. The Bulgarian view, the Greek view, the Serbian view is that they stole our children.、Yeah. Either way, they built a huge military,、um, and they were able to just bulldoze the European enemies well into the 17th century when it starts to turn. Now, what that meant over time, in other words, over a couple of hundred years, is the Ottomans created a new Ottoman elite of the descendants of these originally slaves, and those Ottoman elites. Who were then Muslim, so these are the Muslim descendants of their non-Muslim ancestors, went on to become the elites of the Ottoman Empire through its more stable period, the 17th, 18th into the 19th century. And in the 19th century, as the as the empire is is receding and starting to unravel,
those were Muslim populations in the Balkans. And they, they had become, through conversion, they went from being, you know, two or three percent of the population up to maybe 30, 40 percent of the population. And then in the 19th century, as these homogenous nation states evolved, you know, what we today um, know of as Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Croatia, as all of those states emerged, they would kick out the Muslims and they would kick out basically those loyal to the Ottoman Empire, especially the Muslims. And they became the refugees who poured into Anatolia in the 19th century and in effect are the ancestors of, of much of today's Turkey. Wow. Why, why did they even do that? What was the methodology behind it? I think their idea was to create a, an Islamic elite or a, a loyal Ottoman. Uh, I don't know how important to make religion in this because the more important thing is that they're loyal Ottoman servants, if you will. And, and it is often compared to the U.S. melting pot idea. And, and the comparison's not totally off because the Ottoman Empire as a melting pot would take, in effect, anyone that wanted to join the team. So uh, in terms of this conscription, it's the Balkan peasantry. And, and they would go into the state and they would be turned into the Janissaries or the bureaucrats. But at the same time, uh, if you were a European who wanted to join the Ottomans, that you would be known as a renegade. And there was this whole phenomenon of renegades who joined the Ottoman team, if you will, because they liked the Ottomans. So there are prominent examples of that. So there's a prominent ethnic Hungarian who became the first Ottoman publisher, uh, Mutafetika. And there's, there's cases of, you know, Germans, English, French, doesn't matter. They, they liked the Ottomans and they became Ottomans. So that's the renegade phenomenon. And they're known as renegades. Is there anything on the Asian side that happens? On the on the Asian side, if you mean East Asia, not much. There's not much contact with East Asia, but there is contact with South Asia, Central Asia, Iran, and Afghanistan for sure. And and similarly, anyone who wants to join the Ottoman team, if you will, or the Ottoman side, was was welcome with open arms. And that was true right up to the very end. So, you know, into the early 20th century, if you if you didn't like uh, the expansion of the Russian Empire, and you were a Central Asian, you could basically migrate to the Ottoman Empire if you can figure out how to get there, and they would welcome you and settle you and set you up, and, and everything would be fine afterwards, theoretically. And that's also the ancestors of today's uh, Turks. Huh. So the Ottoman Empire has no history of hatred towards immigrants or people of other cultural backgrounds? Uh, not that I can point to. They were very cosmopolitan. They were accepting of diversity. They, they saw diversity as strength. And this, again, is why that comparison to the American melting pot sometimes works. They, they like diversity. Um, there's definitely stresses with uh, their enemies. So who were their big enemies? Well, in the earlier part of their history, their biggest enemy was actually Safavid Shiite Iran, um, and then it switched to being the Habsburgs, you know, in, in Austria and across the Balkan frontier. And then it became the Russians. Uh, so the Russians were the big enemy from uh, the early 18th century to the very end of the empire in 1923. The Russians were the big enemy. How'd they deal with their enemies? Mm -hmm. What was the Ottoman Empire's battle strategy like? Well, it's these Janissaries. These Janissaries were the, um, the crack infantry of the 16th and into the 17th century, actually 15th to 17th century. They were the best military in Europe. In fact, probably the best military in the world. Now, what do I mean by the best military? It's not so much a question of m numbers. It's more a question of things like tactics and artillery. They had the most advanced artillery into the early 17th century. Maybe a bit earlier, they lost their edge, but you know, they, they, were, they were amongst the leading technology, um, you know, pioneers in artillery until at some point in the 17th century, the Europeans kind of passed them up. And uh, so they were, they were advanced technologically, logistically, uh, and in terms of scale, they also were a huge military at their peak because of the system of the Devshirme, of conscription, which precedes 
the European conscription. So the, the earliest European conscription I've ever heard of, mind you, I might be missing a beat or something, but uh, was Prussia. And Prussia isn't a story until the 18th century. So the Ottomans are conscripting, if you will, in the late 15th century. And the Prussians, your proto-Germans, they don't do it till the 18th century. Okay, so, so they just completely demolished and went through Europe. And European, I, I think why they stopped was was of weather, correct? They just couldn't handle the cold. Well, the, the the theory as to why they didn't expand further that I'm personally most comfortable with is the idea that they basically reached the limits of what they could do with their military logistics, or they they just got uh, so big <laughs> that going any further would have meant that they had to completely change the way they did it because the the way they did it in the early modern period is they would campaign from roughly spring to fall. So they would, they would sort of call the troops together. Uh, with the, so they'd send letters all over the empire. They'd say, be at this field um, on you know April 15th or something. And then they would all assemble, and then they would start marching in the direction that they were conquering. Well, that's all fine and dandy if you only need to go up to, let's say, four or 500 miles. But when you need to go eight or nine hundred miles, it becomes a real issue. Like you can't get there and get back in one campaign season. So that's one theory as to why they didn't go even further while they were on top of the world militarily. And the period that they were on top of the world militarily runs from roughly the mid 15th century to the to the mid 17th century. There's a 200 year period there. And what I always find um, really fascinating and problematic is how in Western civilization textbooks that, that are being sold at college campuses th across the USA, the Ottomans tend to get about uh, three or four paragraphs in the Renaissance chapter where all they say is uh, something like, Suleiman the Magnificent was a notable ruler, and that's about it. And in the reality is, for a couple of hundred years there, the Ottomans completely dominated European politics, European fears, European um, changes in terms of religion and philosophy. The Ottomans were the ones driving the driving the narrative, and then and then it shifts again with the emergence of the Enlightenment era in the in the 18th century. It starts to change, but for for what what we know of as the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Scientific Revolution, those are the chapter titles always, like in every Western Civ textbook. Those three chapters should be all about the Ottomans, and they never are. The Ottomans are a bit player in those three chapters, and they shouldn't be. There's one, there's one book that just came out that I'm, I'm really quite happy about on the whole, maybe not in every single way, and it's by Mark Baer, a colleague of mine who used to be in graduate school with me. The main contribution of this book, so it's called The Ottomans, Khans, Caesars, and Caliphs. Mm -hmm. So that's the correct name. It just came out about four or five months ago, and he's trying to drive this reinterpretation of European history to include the Ottomans. That's his primary agenda, and I think the book is very uh, successful in doing that, and, uh, and it's, it's attracting attention. So hopefully in the next generation of Western Civ textbooks, they'll, they'll include the Ottomans, but it hasn't happened yet.